Oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. Mm-hmm. You can tell. <laughs> I've been this nervous since we had that other guy on the show. Remember that guy who came in, um, who wrote The Power of Now? Oh, right. Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. I've been, I, I was really nervous for that one, too. Yeah, I was nervous for that one as well. But this, this is you, You're cool as a cucumber. This guy's, <laughs> this is my favorite author. Yeah, I know. I, I'm mean, fine today. <laughs> I kind of okay. wish that it was just like, he's surprised on the show. Yeah. But having found out yesterday he's going to be on the show, I've just been nervous since yesterday till till this very moment. <sighs> um, but he's on hold right now, so I'll just try to keep me under control, okay? Try and sound if smart. If I start to scream, just take over. Oh, I will. Trust me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm just I'm honored right now to uh, bring on my favorite author. He's written a, a bunch of great books, all New York Times bestsellers. The Tipping Point, where he discusses trends. Blink, where he discusses uh, first impressions and snap judgments that we all make and how we come to those conclusions. Outliers, where he talks about uh, kind of obscure um, ideas about success. What the Dog Saw, which is his latest book that came out this year, which is a collection of articles he's written for the New Yorker magazine, where he is still a staff writer. And uh, he's on hold right now. Let's bring him on, the one, the only, Malcolm Gladwell. The Kid Carson Show welcomes New York Times bestselling author Malcolm Gladwell. How are you? I already feel like I'm going to blow it. <laughs> Good. How are you? I'm very well. Am I, am I blushing already? You are. I, you can't believe the first words you said to the man was, I can't believe I'm going to blow it. I just... Like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Malcolm, wow. I'm such a huge fan of yours. Oh, it's very kind of you. Where are you calling from right now? I am in New York City. New York City? Where I live, yes. Yeah. Now, so when you do these interviews, are you, like, relaxing in a... A gentleman's chair, lounging, smoking a pipe, or what do you do? I'm sitting, sitting at my desk. Incredibly, I've left the couch and I'm now at my desk. I just picture you in a really wonderful office that smells like leather-bound books. And no, no, no. I'm in my in New York. You know, in New York, we live in tiny, tiny, tiny apartments. So I'm in an apartment that's probably the size of like your closet. At home. <laughs> <laughs> I'd seen an interview you did uh, about a year ago, and. In the interview, you had said that despite all the money you've made, you still rent an apartment. I do, yes. Isn't that... Um, everybody is... rents in New York. No, we don't buy things. I don't, this is a very kind of... New York City is a place of renters. Not a... You don't... People don't... Things are so expensive, it seems crazy to kind of... I just picture you like rolling like P. Diddy because, I mean, you've made a, a good living. No, I have a... I drive a Volkswagen. I ride around the city on my bicycle. Um, I'm a Canadian, you know, I don't get carried away by all this. It's a very American thing to do to kind of get all blingy, Aww, but that's pretty nice. cool. Um, where do you even start, Nira? Where oh, do I even God. start? Just, just take a deep breath for a second. <sighs> uh, we'd like to let you know that he's a huge fan, so if he sounds like a bumbling idiot at any point, it's just because he loves you oh. so much. Oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> and and I, I, you're the kind of guy you'd love to sit down with for like four hours and have a beer with and just talk about tons of stuff. I know we have a few minutes with you. Very excited that you're coming to town next week for the... Um, I know, me F- too. Yeah, the F5... Expo. Expo, okay. yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we should maybe focus on what you're going to be talking about there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, the, so the implications of social media. What happens to the way in which we um, communicate? or what, 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 what impact are all of these technological changes, Twitter, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all these kinds of things, going to have on the way we communicate, the way we um, organize society, the way movements start, the way... And I'm interested in sort of figuring out, is there a downside to it? Mm, I um, would like to hear about that. That's what I'm going to talk about is, because um, everything, you know, every great innovation has a flip side. And I, one, one of the things that happens when we're in the midst of technological upheavals is that we concentrate a lot on the good parts and we forget about the downside. And I want to talk about, you know, is there a downside? And if so, what is it? Can you give us some teasers of what might be some of the oh, downsides? Oh, I can't give it away. Oh, that's... No, no, I can, I can tell you. No, I'm, what I'm concerned is if it gets, if it's really, really, really easy to organize people um, and to bring them together in a movement, does that mean you don't do the hard work of forming powerful relationships and developing a coherent message? In other words, are we entering an age where we can, where the social movements we create will be a mile wide and an inch deep? Because the payoff doesn't seem as much. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I look at sort of recent social movements, and I see them as being, I, it's not having any kind of legs. It's not a grassroots thing. Yeah. That's, and that's what, so that's what I want to explore. How do you, how do you create grass, real, true grassroots movements in an age when I can sit at my computer and get 
100,000 people together in 10 minutes, you know? Hmm. Are, um, just because of something like that with all the social media that we have access to, are communication skills actually being depleted instead of being enhanced? Well, I think, I mean, that's something I want to talk about as well. I think there are certain kinds of skills that we're getting better at and certain kinds of skills that are um, atrophying. Um, so the, the, what you don't learn if you spend your lifetime communicating with people, um, you know, on a computer or a BlackBerry, um, what you don't know are the, are the kinds of skills that are specific to kind of face-to-face interaction. Um, and that's my worry on if we have a generation growing up who literally their only, their principal mode of communication is that little device in front of them. Do they learn about sort of nonverbal cues? Do they learn about explaining themselves um, clearly in person? Do they learn about, you know, I don't know. I mean, the kind of, there's certain tools of empathy that you only get from extended, um, focused, inter- face-to-face interaction with people, right? Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's fascinating how they say that all this stuff is, all this techno, you know, technology is bringing us closer together, but at the same time it's actually separating us more. Yeah. Well, it, it does. I mean, there's a whole school of, of, of sociology now that's looking at um, these impacts, and what they're, what they're pointing out is that... Um, the local ties are getting replaced with international, not international, but far-flung ties. In other words, it's as easy for me to communicate with the person in Singapore as it is with the person next door, right? So it used to be the case that in communication, we always favored people who were close at hand. And now there's no, there's no kind of bias in favor of the local. And that's very important because there are certain kinds of things that can only be done locally, mm-hmm. right? Um, that if I want to start up, a really powerful political movement, it of necessity has to be a movement that starts in my neighborhood. But what happens if the neighborhood isn't the kind of preferred place of interaction anymore? Which is not really. I mean, when I was growing up, we all knew each other's, I mean, the neighbors, we all knew each other, the kids all played together, it was an open door policy in the neighborhood. I don't really feel that way anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I mean, I don't, it's not an entirely bad thing. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to stand up there and be a kind of, you know, 70-year-old curmudgeon, this damn internet, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I just want to point out that there's a flip side, and one of the things we have to do is figure out ways to deal with the downside, even as we're celebrating this enormous um, tool that we've been given. Hmm. Well, thanks for calling. (laughs) (laughs) I I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I think it's very fascinating that, you know, I mean, I'm into technology to a certain degree, but it does kind of frighten me because I think that, you know, you do lose a sense of yourself because everything is so instant all the time that you don't have those deep-rooted feelings like you used to with things. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean... It'd be fun to talk about how flirting has changed. Oh, totally. Oh, that would be great. Totally. I mean, off the top of your head, how do you feel that um, relationships have changed now? With I don't know. I suspect, you know, the thing is, if you do all of your flirting instantaneously and online, you can get away with saying things that you would never say face-to-face. Yeah. Right? I mean, so I, you know, it's, I wonder if it's become a lot less subtle. It's really hard. Actually, a girlfriend of mine was telling me about that because she can flirt with this guy back and forth over text messages and instant messaging. But when they're in person, they have no idea how to act with each other. (laughs) Seriously. And it's like, and I didn't know what to say because I come from an age where we didn't do that. (laughs) You know, we actually went on dates (laughs) and talked on the phone. In the olden days. Exactly. In the olden days, yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And if if people now are flirting through technology, like flirting through text messages and, and, um, um, MSN and whatnot and Facebook sending each other winks and pokes and whatnot. Now, does that move human beings closer to being able to, in the future, have full-blown loving relationships with, like, robots? Oh. Or... oh I, I don't know. Yeah, that's funny. I, was gonna, I thought you were going to say know. something else. Which is, you know... <laughs> Why would he know the answer to that? <laughs> if you're able to flirt through a piece of machinery, not face to face, then in the future we might be able to, if we feel comfortable now having that kind of flirty relationship through computers, right. yeah. then yeah. fall in love with one. Oh, exactly. <laughs> with my lap, yeah, fall in love with my laptop. Yeah. Now he just thinks I'm crazy. He okay. does, exactly. He's like, I don't know how to answer that.